Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Hey all, I'm just about to go on with Dave Feldman to discuss the worldwide issue that's going on at the moment from a data and engineering perspective. So before we go on though, I'd just like to remind you our new movie, Extra Time, is available at extratimemovie.com. It's all one word, extratimemovie.com. And we scanned a lot of Irish sports heroes and some of them become heroes for a second time, get massive calcium scores, huge disease that was completely unrecognized before they were scanned. Uh, and we follow some who intervene with some really smart root cause fixes to stop and reverse heart disease. So it's a great movie from Donald O'Neill of Serial Killers, extratimemovie.com, $3.99 to stream. So you really help us and support us if you can uh, grab that movie, enjoy it, and share it widely as possible to help others. So thanks, and now we'll talk to Dave. So Ivor, uh, it's been a week since we last chatted, and certainly a lot of developments. The one that you know I've been clamoring for this entire time is I've been wanting testing, uh, particularly serology. I've really wanted to uh, get a lot more tests for antibodies, and the one that's been kind of in the forefront for a while that hasn't been as encouraging has been Iceland. Iceland's, uh, it's not been a true random sample, but of those people who volunteered, they really have a very tiny amount that have actually proven to uh, have been infected by SARS-CoV-2. And that said, there's now been a few others that have come out and granted, again, not a lot of random sampling for uh, a couple of these that look somewhat encouraging. One was with uh, pregnant women. Let me actually see if I can pop over to it. Oh, I have them all. Yeah, here on on the slide. Yeah, I have. A, I've gathered. Yeah, I've gathered kind of not all, but but most because uh, absolutely like yourself, I know that this is crucial. So let's let pull up your slide. Say, so is that sharing? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, let's go down now to those slides. So here's a view, if you will, of uh, high corona prevalence in populations. And roughly what I've seen so far, it's not exhaustive, is 15% in a German town. Uh, the Telegraph was quoting 38% in nine Italian regions. Sounds very high. Uh, Boston, uh, just finding a lot more cases, around 20 or 30 times what the data was suggesting in Boston uh, from assessing sewage and finding the virus in sewage. I don't know their calculations, but they were flagging that. There's the one you mentioned, 15% of random women in New York going in to deliver were positive. I think that was the end of March. Don't know that I would say to... random per se. Like it's... it's... Yeah. You know, admit for delivery, it's true. Just real quick, so that the critics aren't jumping on this right away. Technically, there really hasn't been a true randomized serology test until I like just now, I think this morning, I haven't fully been able to look at it, but I think that there's uh, now under one underway in the Netherlands, I believe. And that's really just a hot off the presses one. Um, so a lot of these have been either convenience sampling, uh, such as, for example, the 15% of women testing positive. These were women who were admitted to delivery at two particular hospitals, I believe. And it was uh, physicians that were writing it. Now, that said, I do believe it's a complete sample. So it's it's categorically every uh, pregnant female that came in, not just, you know, for example, ones that seem symptomatic or something along yes. those lines. Uh, so just, just to emphasize that real quick, because I'm sure we'll get comments on it. Oh, yeah, for sure. And that's fair enough. But again, these are just indicators, if you will. Uh, so they're not some kind of hard finished data. They're, they're indicators. But the other one that's fascinating me because, and I'll probably phrase it first. So we've got an R0 uh, virus that's been acknowledged by everyone to be highly communicable, much more than the standard flu that's 1.3. They're saying it's 3.0 recent papers out of the East are saying maybe it's actually 5.4. So it's highly communicable. No one would question that. And we know the first cases were in America in mid-January approximately, and in UK as well, and certainly Italy might have been December. Who knows? 
but we had two and a half months of unrestrained spread of something way more transmissible than the flu. So that's why I struggle with any figures and, you know, by the logic that are saying, oh, we're only 0.8% of the population because it just makes no sense. But listen, I'm open to someone explaining, but it makes no sense. But the interesting thing is actually the next slide. And here you can call it a validation of what I just said in a sense. So there's 92 residents in a San Francisco homeless shelter that have full blown virus present active COVID. I think it's 30 percent approx. That's not even an antibody. Now, I know it's a homeless shelter, but this is end of March as well. Right. You've got an outbreak in Boston as well. Again, close to 30 percent of the people in a homeless shelter had it mostly asymptomatic. And that's live virus, not antibody. And then in the residential care centers, I think in Netherlands and elsewhere, they're seeing one in six. And in the UK, they've got 2,100 care homes that are riddled with this. And that happened before lockdown, largely. And in Ireland, they're just saying now they're getting absolutely hammered with residential homes that they're all across the land, they're infected. So all of this suggests that they're right about the R0 and that a couple of months of unrestrained spread has let it get literally all over the place. And that probably comes back to then, so what do the lockdowns necessarily achieve versus distancing and slowing the curve? If, if it turns out from this kind of stuff and from logic that it's kind of on average all over the place. I mean, it's a fair question, right? I'm, I'm skeptical that it, that that's the way that you're describing it is the case. I do definitely think that it's, uh, it's highly infectious. I do think, as you just mentioned, and it's worth putting extra emphasis on what you just said, these aren't testing both the active viral load of those people that are there along with antibodies, as in we know they either currently have it or they have had it at some point in the past. No, you're saying it's a very large population that is actively undergoing dealing with that infection internally right now. And, the, and <laughs> yes, it's right. And, and of course, uh, it's also known beyond just the infectiousness of it, that there does seem to be a fairly long span of time for many people for which they're fighting this internally, some somewhat asymptomatic, some with mild symptoms, some one, one thing that I certainly hear a lot, and I hope people are aware of is there's a kind of double hump effect that a lot of people are dealing with where they get it, they have mild symptoms, they feel as if they're getting back out of it. And then unfortunately, a lot of times they get a second, more severe hump, if you will. It's, it's almost as if it came back and made it harder. And that also, by the way, is why they're unsure of the degree of reinfection, because that can appear as though it's a reinfection. But, but regardless, because there's such a long residence time for many people, not everybody, but for many people, it's harder and harder to gauge what a safe amount of time is for which you can be sure that the infection has uh, fully resolved itself and that you've been able to mount an appropriate immune response. So anyway, the, reason, the roundabout big reason I, I wanted to emphasize that is because I think the point that you're making, uh, Ivor, which I'm, I'm not completely in agreement with as far as what the lockdown has done is in mitigation, but I am in agreement with in, in that the infectiousness is so incredibly intense, it does make you sort of wonder just how much we really can uh, clamp down on the spread of this uh, and to what degree, and for that matter, really how far around the corner we are with those people who are the um, most at risk. And of course, the nursing homes are, are certainly the one place in which we'd be the most concerned, right? Uh, but, it's, yeah. it, but, it all, but it also further illustrates just how intensely important it is for us to have that antibody test widespread and available because if we see certain places where we're like, oh, this place hasn't gotten it yet because we don't see it being widespread, it's possible that actually it had a period of an event, right, that may have been, that may have taken place back in January or something like that. And there's been a lot of suspicion about that in several places in California. Uh, and again, until we actually have the testing to confirm this to be true or not, we don't know. We don't know. 
Yeah, that's very true. So I think the antibody testing will answer a lot of questions. I am concerned that an antibody test may come out that's not very effective because this is all brand new stuff, right? And then they'll undercount it. But, but listen, we'll wait and see when it comes out and then we'll hopefully see within a few weeks how accurate it was. But even this data here just gives a feeling for people uh, along with the fact that everyone said and always said it's highly transmissible, much more than the normal flu. And we know we had months of unrestrained transmission. And we see kind of proof points like this with active virus in very high percentages in random places, albeit they're a little, um, you know, related to homes. But the latest report out, I don't have a screenshot, but the latest report out, from I think Chinese data where they've gone in and tracked 400 people ultra meticulous. They've said that only I think one in 380 was an outdoor transmission. There were massively indoor transmissions when they traced them. So, you know, it, it, it's why Iceland may not have provided as much effective data is because if you've got a place for which there's not as much high population density, I mean, let's think about it compare Iceland to uh, New York. Of course, New York has, has enormous population density and a lot of uh, proximity uh, of the population with each other. That's, ex you know, that's gonna be extremely relevant to this larger question. Yeah. And, and when you circle back to the Sweden question, just showing now we've got Sweden and okay, they love comparing it to uh, Norway and Finland, but geographically and density, they're very different. And the best compare is Denmark because Denmark is 5 million people and a lot of Sweden population is in an area at the bottom of Sweden connected to Denmark with around f at least 5 million in that quadrant. And that's where all the uh, cases are and all the deaths coming from is down in the Stockholm and the, the cities. So it's comparable to Denmark. And you can see here, yes, yeah, Sweden four weeks ago didn't lock down at all. The people are being very good, they're distancing, but their cafes, bars are open. Uh, they're advising 70 year olds to stay at home and stay away, but not forcing it. So it's a very soft form of lockdown. And Denmark did the hardcore full metal jacket. So there's a double difference. But then the Swedish guys are saying we got extremely hard hit in our nursing homes. And I saw figures recently that 58% of their deaths are nursing home related. But in Denmark, I think it's sub 40. And even that difference is going to swing these graphs. So the jury's out, but I will show another thing as well. Oh, one last point. This is really important. I saw data out of, believe it or not, West Coast US data from February, where they had tracked cases when they were really trying to find out, you know, how it was spreading or what was going on. You know, it was real storming stuff. And the few case histories they had from initial symptoms or exposure through to death, and they were older people, were like around four weeks plus. So really a lockdown, it's only around four weeks later, maybe, that you're really going to see the curve shift or two, three, four weeks, whatever, by not transmitting to new people. But when you look at these curves, I don't know. If you add a four week lag or a three week lag, you know, you begin to say, well, hold on a minute. Are these explained by lockdown? And the only other positive thing I'll have to say on behalf of the Swedish people, because I have strong genetic links there, this is their critical care wards from an article out today. And as you can see, it looks like they've leveled off pretty good. You know, that's up to 13th of April. So I, I, I recognize for sure there's going to be some people who are going to be critical of, of the analysis. And I think I could represent for a moment what I think that they would say. Is the first is that they, they would want to look at Sweden as far as when it's reached a certain threshold of cases to suggest that, in fact, uh, the virus came in. Could you go to the prior slide just real quick? Oh, yeah. The one that you had had up from before. So for example, uh, a lot of these graphs, they start where, for example, there was 100 confirmed cases or something along those lines, which I think would probably end up adjusting this graph. Now, I'm not saying that I believe that that's the better or worse way, but I, I, I know that they would probably be commenting right away that that then makes this graph look a lot different. It makes it look like yeah. the curvature going upwards is much more pronounced with Sweden if you start at that range, right? Well, the only... 
the only thing though just to answer that really quickly on the fly the article today actually it attenuated the apparent differences when it was corrected for what you said this is actually just raw that's my understand yeah so and and in your defense i i like being able to look at a lot of visual data raw while while con you know acknowledging what problems there are with it one of my big complaints just full stop is whenever i feel like data is being being curated for me uh, in advance. So I, I do like to see raw. Another thing that I'm going to bring up and I was talking about with Dr. Avi, who is a little more bearish on this, is I also do like all cause mortality. And that's another thing that I think that they'll bring up and for which the data is not completely abundantly clear yet. Uh, but some people have been critical of Sweden for saying that they're not, they're not recording enough uh, deaths coming back. Uh, you just mentioned, for example, the um, uh, the re retirement homes or the intensive care homes, right? Yeah, and uh, there may be, I think Sweden and Denmark are still a pretty good compare because the governments are working very closely together. And Denmark actually now is opening up schools today. So Denmark are coming out of it, out of the lockdown. Uh, but they've been working very close together. So I think these kind of nursing home versus hospital and definition of death whether it was really cancer. Or, I think that shouldn't be too bad. And no one is suggesting in these Nordic countries that there's any disparity there. I, I think the disparities are the initial dynamics of spread, the proportion of care homes hit, and the geographics and people movement, and all of those factors, absolutely. But no one's suggesting it's, it's definitions of death for, for these countries at the moment. Right. And, and that's, I think that's what I'm just, I'm kind of bringing forward as a metric I'm interested in without necessarily assigning to what degree it's uh, the, you know, COVID-19 is specifically the response, uh, responsible party for it. Right. But yeah. if you look right now at New York, that's a good example of where certainly all cause mortalities have increased and it seems very suggestive that it is coronavirus. Now that said, can we get that same kind of tally in these Scandinavian countries? I'd be very interested in that. And this isn't to say, and I, I can't emphasize this enough because it's hard to sort of straddle both sides of this. This isn't to say that I don't think that this isn't both a very highly infectious disease and that it's also very deadly. That the big question we're all trying to narrow down is what, it, what are the trade-offs, first of all, and to, to get to that point, we need to get better information. We're better, we have more information today than we do from a week ago, but it's still maddeningly small, right? Uh, however, the information that we have today, particularly the slides that you were just showing from the last few days, the same studies that I was talking to you about off air beforehand, those are encouraging to me that at least my worst fears that there hasn't been as much spread and that the rate of those people who are now immune is not actually that small. In other words, compared to existing cases that we know for sure exist, that to me is encouraging. I can't, it's hard for me not to feel like it's at least green shoots. I, again, until we have true randomized serology, I don't know that I can put a lot of stock into it. But as far as early indicators beyond Iceland, I'm, I don't know. I think it's pretty, there's a pretty decent chance that a lot of this spread is happening uh, either mildly symptomatically or asymptomatically, and that there probably are a lot more people than we feared. Um, that uh, have already gone through the cycle of this virus. And, you know, that's, again, that's not, to, that's not to take away from the deadliness of this. That's not to say that this isn't still a big concern and that we shouldn't be taking extraordinary measures. But do I think it's a little bit of good news? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I think we have to be realistic and acknowledge some good news without betting the farm on it or doing something stupid now at the moment we're so safe because it's in such lockdown and arguably a smart kind of distancing with masks and over 65s you know kind of lockdown and people with medical conditions you could argue would have achieved as much but either way we're in such massive lockdown we can discuss this freely and discuss positives without a risk of someone hearing us and inappropriately stopping a lockdown, right? That's not going to happen. So I agree with you. But here, to your point, Dave, you like all-cause mortality, so do I. But we had to wait for the data.
because this was slow in coming. But someone sent me this a couple of days ago. And for the overall population in Portugal, you see a clear big spike coming in in all-cause mortality for early April. Exactly as you'd expect. We know this flu-type illness is very severe on particular people. And we know there's a lot of deaths. So here you see the big spike coming up. Fine. But that's the whole population spike. Look at the data for under 65s in Portugal for the same data. No spike. So this is early data, but in fairness, it's certainly not lagging too much because we see the big spike. But there's no spike below 65. And I just think it's important for people to realize it's not just older are at more at risk or metabolically unhealthy are more at risk. That, that's, that's not an engineering statement. More is too weak. It's enormously, overwhelmingly biased to over 65s and metabolically unhealthy. And I'm amazed that the media hardly mention that, even though ethically they should be making it so clear to people who's at risk, that we protect them. And, and that motivates us as well for the healthy who are not at risk to not spread it on behalf of the people who are most at risk. But you can just see it here and in all the other data I'm getting from other countries. You know, the, the graph of, of serious complications and certainly death is just a massive tail for the over 60s. And of course, enormously connected to metabolic ill health. I'm not seeing that clarified to people are, are you seeing much of that i so i will make a qualifier my qualifier is that i i think that what you just said i've seen plenty of evidence that compels me to agree on the mortality end of the spectrum i'm not sure on the severity of the outcome i've not seen as much that does an age stratification on just age only, not on, uh, for example, metabolic syndrome and so forth, but just age only on severity of outcome where they survive. So for example, how many people in each age group gets intubated, right? How many end up going on a ventilator? I, and to be sure, this may just be a lack of pursuit on my part for looking into it, mm. uh, but I've been mainly focused on the mortality. On the mortality side, yeah, I've seen exactly what you're talking about. I've seen that I mean, certainly I've reached out to my parents <laughs> to emphasize that I'm, you know, I'm not that worried about my sister, uh, who's just six years older than I am. Uh, I am much more worried about my parents. And this isn't to say that I, you know, don't think that my sister could get severely ill from this disease. I just know that from an odds ratio, her getting ill and dying from this disease is certainly much lower than what I see in these populations you're talking about that are over 65, which definitely includes my parents and many people I know, right? Uh, it's it's very yeah. relevant. Yeah, for sure. And I have many relations who would not be healthy. They've had stents, hypertension and stuff. And of course, I've got all those people too. Some people on Twitter kind of say, oh, you're not thinking of the people. Of course I am. But I also want to focus on the data. Crisis management is focusing on the data and not getting too emotional about it so you can have clarity, in fairness. But my mother is 80 now, close enough. But to be honest, she's insulin sensitive. I've seen her bloods uh, extremely healthy. I think her risk is lower than a 50 year old diabetic in New York, basically. So and I've kind of informed her that there's no definites. But this has come up with Dr. Steve Horvitz, with Dr. Paul Mason, with Dr. Ron Rosedale in the last few days. There's no question you're much better off being in your 70s and metabolically healthy and leptin sensitive and insulin sensitive than you are in your 50s with a diabetic physiology. So again, of course, this is too complex to have in the media. I, I understand that. I was more surprised they weren't even really talking about the numbers. But death really is the last word. And I know it's terrible to go through suffering, but once the hospital capacity is not exceeded or overwhelmed, generally people who don't die from COVID, you know, they got their care. Uh, broadly speaking. So death, I think, to your point earlier, death is still really important. I mean, let's face it. it it's the big thing. I, it, well, it's, it's certainly a metric everybody's going to be paying very close attention to, uh, to 
break down this cost benefit analysis. You and I both know that, of course, when you really sit down with somebody and you really break it out, health span is of enormous relevance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so how long you remain healthy and enjoy life is certainly a very big deal. Many of us would like to just check out shortly after that span of time ends anyway. But I will say this, I am somewhat skeptical as to whether, whether I, would, I would put it as, you know, age is the final word per se. Unfortunately, the data out of my country is going to be very instructive in that regard. Are we going to see a lot more people you know, in their middle age that are going to be going down from this virus because we have such a huge prevalence of obesity and diabetes and, you know, many of the major markers of metabolic syndrome. I, if I had to bet, I think that that's probably going to be more the, likely the final word over age. It's just that age typically can come with that, especially in many of these countries that are not in as good a shape. This, by the way, is what gets brought up a lot of times with the Scandinavian countries is, Comparing their population and their risk outcomes with the U.S. is just kind of, um, it seems kind of silly. And as somebody who's sort of visited those countries, I can vouch for that. I, I, love, I love to go, for example, to Amsterdam, right? But the thing I notice that my wife and I notice every time we walk around the streets, there's like, man, there's so many healthier people per capita <laughs> relative to uh, the U S it's so strikingly no and almost everybody's riding their bike. Like that's a place that's entirely ruled by bikes. I, and I, I, I live in Las Vegas. I basically never see bikes. I just see people driving their car a few blocks just to get to the store where they're going to buy bad food. And I just, I, I do get worried about this sometimes. You know, that is a very important point to clarify. I mean, I'm kind of Eurocentric at the moment, not just because of my location, but it, it kind of takes some of that crazy American noise out of it. Uh, and, and it's a little more down to just average human physiology and, and distributions, etc. But I agree in Stockholm, myself and my wife Eilish a few years ago, just were stunned. We commented on it for a couple of days at the lack of obesity. It was quite stunning in a city incredible so i think america's got is going to have a much fatter tail of younger people being unfortunately impacted because of the massive metabolic disease and i think the uk is in pretty bad shape as well uh but europe mainland i agree it's kind of a different story and ireland's not that bad i mean ireland at the moment consistently median age of infection 46 median age of death in the 80s you know uh, and you're going to see that all over Europe on um, the graph we just showed. And you'll also see the tail even over 90s is a substantial proportion. Imagine that over 90s is a substantial chunk of the debt figures. Uh, who'd, have, who'd have thought? But yeah. But this, but this is kind of just the problem. This is kind of the problem with the healthcare system in general, in that uh, when you do the breakdown of the numbers, and this was long before coronavirus, 80% of our healthcare costs go into, you know, people's last two to four weeks of life, right? So a lot of times, the closer you are to the end, the more expense there usually is put forward towards that. Uh, you and I have both known and have certainly speculated for some time that some number of people who will be dying earlier in this pandemic you know, can potentially have been uh, those people who might have been dying inside of the year. Again, it doesn't make it any better. And for that matter, it doesn't mean that that's entirely the course of the disease, that it's just going to take out the long-hanging fruit, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but, the, but the point is, we don't know what amount that changes the perspective of the ongoing uh, progression. But it is relevant towards this larger calculus of being already not just old, but also um, also having a compromised immune system, also already having a number of different underlying complications, and how much that's going to uh, matter towards your ability to mount an immune response to the disease. I did yeah, want to. I did want to. I did want to share two couple quick anecdotes um, that uh, I thought were interesting. My wife has a lot of family who are in uh, the healthcare system, particularly a couple of nurses. One that's a nurse in Chicago and. Uh, reported some very interesting things. They they actually he feels 
that they are actually very well suited and well positioned to be able to take on coronavirus. They had done a lot of things to shift on capacity. There's apparently a lot of clinics that uh, had been repurposed to allow for the overflow should it come. And interestingly enough, it wasn't clinics that were already operational with say like elective procedures. They were just clinics that were actually being unused and were space that might've been getting used for something else, but are now set. He actually feels pretty good in spite of Chicago being a fairly high density population area. As a counter story, there's another one who's in Houston. They're getting hit pretty hard and it's not just a private hospital, it's a county hospital. So they have to um, work a lot more with those people who are under uh, assistance and so forth. And what they're finding is that actually they're getting overwhelmed from, for example, um, right, right now they've let uh, out smaller criminal offenders um, from the jails in order to, because they're concerned about the spread of the infection within the jails. The downside is, is a lot of these prisoners have nowhere to go. And so a lot of times they know how to work the system to some degree, and then we'll ultimately end up in a hospital. So they don't like, for example, the rules of the shelter. They know it sounds crazy that you'd go to a hospital to ultimately have somewhere to stay and sleep, but that's a lot of times the case. And the irony is, this adds to the capacity that they have to deal with in the ER. Another thing that's kind of ironic is that there's been a big surge in domestic violence in Houston because now with more people being quarantined at home, uh, particularly you know the state of Texas being very pro-gun and so forth, there's there is uh, a lot more violence uh, that you know involves uh, abuse or gunshot wounds and so forth. It's it's a bit concerning. Um, and unfortunately, as some of these patients come in unconscious, they have to fully PP up a, a, a personal protective uh, gear because usually what they're doing is in, on the intake, they're asking people if they have symptoms of COVID uh, to determine whether or not uh, they need to you know, quarantine them into a special area and so forth. So again, both of these nurses are very much in support of the lockdown, and I should emphasize that. But it is kind of interesting to see a little bit more on the ground, a lot of the uh, different logistics that you have to deal with above and beyond just trying to work with the capacity to deal with those people you know for sure are infected. There are some other consequences that can kind of come into play that, you know, may, my hope, my hope is that some of this will be relieved when we have uh, a, a version following the lockdown that might still, still be somewhat more restrictive but can account for some of these problems. Yeah, unintended consequences, no question. I was thinking about that yeah, weeks ago, that there's going to be a massive unintended consequences. And the problem is the politicians right now and the epidemiologists who've been taken out from under a stone in their universities and actually they're getting some limelight. I think they're kind of appreciating that maybe, but, but they, they're not thinking about so much about those other things. I, I'm almost sure of it. All they're thinking about is, oh, people will die. We will save people. We will lock everything down. Fine and fair enough. But it's not proper crisis management, I think. I mean, we've got lockdown versus, let's say, what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. You've got an option where you put over 65s or under 65s maybe with metabolic problems or ill health, and you make sure they're safe. But the under 65s who are healthy which have vanishingly low impacts relatively, they're going to get it at some point. They get it, you don't overload the system. They're the kind of two options and the masks and all you use with the second option. Who knows which is better? I think two and a half months after unrestrained spread of a highly transmissible virus, if you're in that kind of country, there's not going to be a huge difference between lockdown and doing a really smart distancing with all the other measures and isolation of the older and the exposed. And the cost you mentioned, well, 30,000 sterling, which is like $40,000, has always been used as the value to save a quality adjusted life here. So for a healthy person, a life year, uh, maybe you'd have two years for a person with very poor quality of life. But let's say $40,000 per life year saved. They're going to be probably a hundred times that for the life here saved with this. I'm not saying that's wrong, but you know, their standard, which they used for years, and it's not callous, they gotta 
they got to have some standard. It's going to be more like millions per, li- or per life year saved, I would guess. But listen, we'll, we'll find out afterwards. Maybe, maybe many millions. We'll see. Yeah, and, and I myself, I'm, I'll just I'll say this more for the audience than for you, as you know, and as I've said to both Tucker and Avi, um, I'm, I'm more of an unknownist, if you can call it that, in that I just don't feel like we've gotten enough data that I could even propose a particular policy. I do feel as though the lockdown has bought us some time, and there are some things, for example, there's some things we've learned about the virus and how to treat it that have been a value, but could I say, oh, we for sure only could have learned that while we're under lockdown as opposed to like a more restrictive uh, outcome policy. I can't say I know that for sure, but ironically, (laughs) as with my cholesterol research, there does seem to be a lot of people, particularly in the comments, who do want to assign a hard position to me uh, in spite of, you know, my trying to really just explore this from every perspective with everybody uh, who's a guest who comes on. So, and you know, just or just for a black humor, if it's funny, but it's also quite scary. I'm not scared easily, uh, generally. The one thing that scares me, though, and I think we touched on it before, is anything that moves towards corporatization or freedoms being impinged upon. Anything that even hints at that is the only thing that makes me uneasy. I'm not worried about all the other stuff, and I must say. Uh, this has brought more authoritarian type uh, kind of weevils out of the woodwork than I have seen in a long, long time. I mean, Twitter is incredible. You've probably seen examples for doctors, full MDs, who just simply said what Sweden are actually kind of doing. You know, the younger, healthy are not going to be impacted. They might as well kind of get it, and it will help with the immunity. It won't be magic herd immunity, not the magic just they will be more robust when the second wave comes and by not being affected as much will protect the older more and this is all reasonable talk and i believe a doctor has been reported to the medical board and to twitter now that's the scary stuff for me in a way i mean that's oh that's worrying to even see that going on you know as you know i i tend to be a fan of the free market of ideas uh, and I, I think that it's to some degree, it's to the listener to um, judge for themselves how much something is a credible source or not. But to many other people that might be considered very radical and that they would favor more of a kind of a top down, more authoritative uh, standpoint, um, particularly when, you know, we're, we're all facing something together. And that's, you know, that's, I guess, all I could really say about that. And that's fair enough. And I, my view, I think it's even more important to allow free speech when we're all caught up in a mess where the data is not clear. It's actually when you really get tested as to your support for free speech. And I know, I just say there are exceptions. If someone is driving hate and clearly causing riots and, and racial minorities to be beaten or hurt, you know, the Nazism kind of extreme stuff. There are some limits to free speech, but the example I gave and many other like it uh, in the last couple of weeks, wow, no way did they come within a billion miles of those exceptions. It, it, so it's truly kind of scary to see it happening. But listen, we'll, we'll see how the next couple of weeks go. The data gets clearer. Absolutely. Well, once again, it's been great checking in with you, Ivor. I'm sure I'll see you again next week. Absolutely, Dave. Good man. Thanks. Okay, guys, interesting data. And the jury is still out on a lot of the questions we discussed, as you can see. So just a final reminder that uh, extratimemovie.com, our new movie on Irish sports stars, took a year and a bit to shoot, a lot of effort, and uh, really happy with the result. We look at stopping and reversing heart disease with some really smart interventions and explain it all. So hopefully you can support us by streaming or downloading at extratimemovie.com. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen. And go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease.